Welcome to the Changemakers podcast brought to you by Graf Martin Integrated Marketing Solutions for Good. This season, we're focusing on what nonprofit leadership looks like in this next normal. I'm your host, Ellen Graf Martin, and each episode, you'll get to join me in conversation with some of my friends and peers in the Canadian nonprofit space who are change makers and groundbreakers across Canada and beyond. Let's jump in. Friends, I am so excited that you get to meet my friend and coworker, Cheryl Hotchkiss, today um, for a very special edition of the Changemakers podcast. I know I say that about other things, but this really is a very special podcast. Now, what you don't know is that Cheryl's just recording down the hall from me, but we're we're keeping it consistent here because it is 2020 and everything's a bit weird. Um, but welcome, Cheryl. I'm so glad that you can join me for this special edition of the podcast. So Cheryl, can you tell us who you are, what you do, and why you love it? So who I am is Cheryl, as you said, um, Cheryl Hodgkiss. I am a mother of two and a wife of one. Um, And my two are in university now. So I'm going through a phase of life where they're not present in my everyday physically. Um, And I am a, I guess you call it an engagement communications and marketing professional. Um, I've been working in that field for over 25 years and um, working exclusively and not for profits um, and uh, have done so happily and in two large organizations and then now I'm doing so happily in a, a small organization in Elmira which gets me back a bit to my roots as being a, a farm daughter farmer's daughter um, and working with smaller not-for-profits that need support in their mission. So tell us a little bit about that nonprofit experience because it isn't inconsequential. And I'll tell, I want to tell one little thing on you. Cheryl Cheryl and I got to travel in December and just like as a matter of conversation, you mentioned that you had been part of the um, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women report. That's not a small thing. Um, You've, you've done some really incredible things. So tell us a little bit about your, your stage till now. Sure. So um, when I was with Amnesty International, I became very passionate about women's rights and particularly for women who are on the margins, racialized women that tend to experience higher degrees of discrimination. So I was very active in Amnesty International in bringing about gender equality and worked with the global organization to um, implement two campaigns on ending violence against women. I found myself in 1995 um, in an airport in Beijing, having paid my own way to go to Beijing to the uh, Fourth World Conference on Women's Rights. Uh, There was a UN conference and a um, uh, side conference uh, and an NGO forum, they called it. And I remember landing in this airport by myself, having no idea what I was doing. I'm like, what am I doing here? Why am I doing this? This makes no sense. Anyway, it was the beginning or, or the, the sort of meaningful beginning on a long journey working on women's human rights. And um, it was really fascinating because when we were in China, Amnesty, I was working for Amnesty International and we were involved in um, some protests, which was very unusual for Beijing. And we found ourselves constantly being followed and photographed and videotaped and I actually ended up going to the South Korean embassy uh, to advocate for a young woman who had been imprisoned because of her activism. Um, And, uh, you know, it was a very stark reminder for me of how easy it is for us as Canadians to engage our government and to talk about issues um, isn't easy for others in other countries. So that journey led into a process where Amnesty decided to look at the issue of violence against women in Canada. And that took me across the country talking to different women's groups to find out what an organization like Amnesty could do to benefit the movement and not take over and not be, you know, telling people what to do, rather listening to what they wanted us to do. 
through a long series of conversations, it ended up that we were asked to research violence against Indigenous women in urban settings and uh, who were disappeared or um, just they became disappeared because no one was researching or trying to find them. So I was part of a small team that helped to write the report called Missing and Murdered Women. Stolen Sisters is what it was called. Uh, it was written by a now professor at uh, the Win University of Windsor, a law professor, um, Beverly, and her name at the moment escapes me, but um, she went on to many wonderful things. And the report became the instigation behind a more public uh, movement um, called Sisters in Spirit, which was the Native Women's Association of Canada's version of it. And it's been taken over by them. So yeah, it was a very pivotal moment. Mm -hmm. It was very important to me. Um, but movements have evolutions and phases and stages. And uh, it, there came a point where the movement became one that I felt wasn't good for me anymore. And um, wasn't helpful for me as an individual and it was time for me to do something else. And at that point, World Vision was looking for someone to help build their uh, advocacy and campaigning capacity because they were pursuing a very aggressive agenda on child and maternal health. And so I went there and, and built their advocacy campaigning initiatives, which again had some amazing results around funding for uh, global funding for maternal and child health and it was very um, fun years of doing things that were really on the edge of what people typically thought World Vision was. Mm -hmm. It included the uh, a moment of being detained for protesting in Italy for which we didn't have a permit. <laughs> so there's many stories but it that's been my journey. So so it's fascinating. And I did prep you to say, I'm going to ask about this. So you've got this extraordinary career, Amnesty International, World Vision, you know, you were with Amnesty for 15 years, World Vision for 11 years. Yeah. And then, um, and then you come to work for this little organization in Elmira. Um, and what you said to me was how, you know, can you help me find some smaller ministries and nonprofits that I can work with? So why would you want to change career a lot mm -hmm. of people might wonder why would you go from working in these big things to the smaller things why um well i had the pleasure of working on the big things when you're working in big things it's hard to see the impact of the big thing you hear about it you read about it it's there in words um but you don't see it um I had the, you know, in both organizations, I was poured into by leadership and resources were given to me to learn both about the area of work that I was doing, but about how to be a leader. Um, and I thought it was time that, you know, that resource that had been poured into me was available to smaller organizations that are doing a lot of work, a lot of very powerful work. But, you know, with far fewer resources and skills around the table. And um, my feeling is that the people on the front line of doing it need to be the right people. Um, and in many ways, you know, the time that we're in, I'm a white middle class woman. Uh, I really feel like my place is at the back mm -hmm. um, and behind the scenes and providing ideas and insight and doing the, the work that people don't like to do uh, so that those that really need to support the change and who've experienced, who have real experience of what needs to change have the resources they need to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, I was tired of commuting <laughs> along the 401 and I genuinely am a small town girl at heart and uh, the opportunity to kind of be in a small town and listen to the clip clop of horses hooves outside my window is uh is very satisfying so those are some of the reasons why so good and and i'm so glad that you chose this and i i will say that you have brought and the word that you use is rigor mm -hmm. 
to our t- our small team as well, because I think that's one of the gifts that having a large organization, there is a rigor, um, which sometimes can become a hindrance in a larger organization. And in a smaller organization, it often is missing um, just because there's a lot. Of- so what are the differences that you're seeing between, I mean, there's positives and negatives or strengths and weaknesses for both. So what are some of the differences that you're seeing as you work with smaller? Well, the differences I would say are, they need the same things, but for different reasons. Mm. Um, you know, I think a lot of organizations lack um, clear processes, clear tools, plans, strategies to help them be the most impactful and effective. You know, you know this well, mm-hmm. when it comes to brand, people say they know what they do, but they know what they do, but nobody else understands what they do. Uh And um, that is the single biggest barrier that organizations face. Large organizations don't have that problem in the same way because they're well known in, in, in a way they're well known, but then when you kind of, you know, ask, what do they do? Many people can't answer that question. So they Mm. have some of the same problems that small organizations have in that, you know, we see small organizations that have these massive long names and these, you know, but nobody understands what they do. Um, so I would say that the tools that larger organizations have that help them develop clarity, um, and help them leverage their resources well, are well applied to small organizations who really seem to lack them, um, and use them better. Large organizations create strategies and processes and they put them aside and they often forget Mm -hmm. that they have them, whereas small organizations to leverage their full team, the clearer the rules and responsibilities are and the processes are, the easier it is for them to do their job. I would say also that um, the great thing about small organizations is you get to do a lot of different things. When you're in a large organization, you kind of have your, your box that you play in and you, you know, the battles are around the edges of those boxes and um, who's responsible for what and who has authority over what, whereas in small organizations, that's not the problem at all. Um, there's too many jobs and not enough people. So, mm-hmm. and I would say though that in small organizations, they are there's more opportunity for authentic relationships across mm. the organization, and everyone knows everybody, and it's a more familial feel to it, mm-hmm. um, community feel to it, which again has its benefits and drawbacks, but. I enjoy that much more than a large organizations where things can start to get very um, unintentionally or intentionally transactional and uh, Mm -hmm. you don't know each other very well. So, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it is, it's amazing the things that we get to work on together. And I know that there have been times when I think you've probably gone, I never thought that I would be doing this sort of thing again. But it's actually kind of fun, I think, to stretch our marketing skill set. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think for me, what's been really good is I was able to move through different levels of leadership at World Vision where, um, you know, I was less and less involved in day-to-day activities and the execution of projects and more about strategy and, and people management. So it's been great to kind of go back to remembering the basics and Mm -hmm. learning about how they've changed and been updated and the tools that are now available. Um, And to remind myself that, you know, some things never change. Some, you know, Mm -hmm. good process is basically the same. It just may have different tools related to it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's been nice to be reminded that I, I still have skills and expertise that can be applied day to day that's helpful. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's been very rewarding Mm -hmm. for me. And we talk a little bit, and I didn't prepare you for this question, but okay. we 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 talk a little bit about mentoring and about next generation on this podcast and how I even feel like I need to be working on my own succession plan at my stage. And you are mentoring me, which seems a little bit like it's, it's like I've um, I've engaged a mentor on, as part of my team. So what do you see, I guess, even as a leadership gap? Mm. Because we we know that the next generation, we need new leaders. 
to rise up, especially in ministry or nonprofit. Um, but there seems to be a mentoring gap. So are there any things that you could say, these are the things that I wish we could teach new leaders? Well, I this season has also allowed me to formally mentor a few other uh, women younger than me. Um, and I would say that the biggest thing that I find I often end up needing to do is tell people, you know what you're talking about. Hmm. What you're talking about is right. You understand you're offering something of value. Um, I think women in particular tend to question themselves quite a bit and think that they need, and I have this same challenge, think they need, you know, so many years of experience or so many letters behind their name to legitimize what they know. Women know a lot. They have a lot of innate expertise about the way that work life needs to be now uh, because we just are built that way. We're raised mm -hmm. that way. And, and we're increasingly seeing men who are built the way we need uh, them mm -hmm. to be built as leaders, both relational um, about coaching and mentoring, but also about getting the work done and being strategic and wise with resources. So I think that's one thing. I think also, um, I think one of the challenges that those that I'm mentoring are facing is being a little more deliberate hmm. in what they're doing and taking the time to, to kind of say, how do I organize this in a way that I can move it on to somebody else who I can put it on paper so that if tomorrow something happened, I would know that I've created enough infrastructure that someone could step in because I don't think we're busy people. You're a mom. Many women leaders are moms who have children at different stages of life and they want to give them everything they can, which takes away from other things. They also want to eat well and be healthy. So um, I think, you know, reminding them that they know a lot and they have a lot of expertise, but also saying, you need to actually get this stuff down on paper. You need to be able to pass it on to someone uh, uh, and to just remind yourself of what you know, to give you yourself confidence too. Those are two things I think I think are the most valuable right now. And I'll tell you that it is valuable because you, I, and I've told you this, but you were the first person who said to me <laughs> so that it was okay for my daughter to be inconvenienced for my work. That sounds funny, but I, I had her at the office and she was having to watch one more episode of Spirit on Netflix because we have her account on Netflix here. Yeah. And I said, you know, poor Carly. And you said, no, she's going to be fine. This is good. She gets to see what this is. And no one had ever said that to me before as a woman who leads. So I see that there is a gap in just understanding what are some of the unique challenges of being a woman who leads and having someone to say, it's okay. <laughs> you actually do know what you're doing. So <laughs> because we have this imposter syndrome, right? Where we mm -hmm. think, uh, and I know I have said this, that uh, the, this great fear that is diminishing over the years, but that one, one day someone's going to figure out that I don't know what I'm talking about. And I think a lot of leaders feel that way. Um, female, male, it doesn't matter. Do you? And I don't know that that changes in a large organization or a small organization. I would say that's true. Um, and, and going back to the earlier point about what this season has done for me is to remind me, I do know what I'm talking about. Mm. I do have experience. Um, and I think that sometimes taking account of, taking inventory about what you do know helps to push back against that imposter syndrome. And I think that, um, you know, I think that as a leader, authenticity is really critical. Being able to say, I don't know, I think it might be this, um, uh, is really important. Uh, mm -hmm. Being able to be, transparent with folks about what you do know and what you think you know and saying, but there may be better ways of doing something. Um, and you've said this to me in different conversations, there may be a better way to do this. Mm -hmm. And I think that openness to insight and, and creating a space for others to come in and offer actually really helps the imposter syndrome as well, because you realize everybody else is kind of figuring it out too. Nobody has the expertise on everything 
but you have expertise on something. You've been successful thus far. So you must be offering something of, of value to people. Um, and I think being able to take account of that, take inventory about what you've done and what you've experienced. Like I encourage a lot of the women that I work with to do a vision statement, even though I hate them with a passion. Um, but I had to do them a couple of times for some academic work I was doing and they become very helpful for me to go back and go, did I do what I say I was going to do and reflect um, sometimes, you know, on a regular basis to say, how have I, how, what have I accomplished? And, and I think it's healthy to do that, to say, yeah, I, I, I do have something to offer here. Mm -hmm. I do have more to learn, but I also have something to offer mm -hmm. now. And I, I do think that is especially helpful in this season. One of the, um, one of the conversations that we've had in the season was with Sean Plummer mm. and he, he admitted that this was a scary season. Like he, he had times where like, I am afraid in this season because we don't know what's coming. Um, we talked to Mark Peterson and he said, you know, this idea of you just kind of want to quit. There has been a point probably, I'm guessing, for almost every leader, whether they would admit it or not, in the last, in 2020, that they've said, I'm just so ready to pack this up and just, I, I always say I'll become a greeter at Costco, but that's a really tough job these days. So mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. you have to make people wear a mask. And so there we are. But I guess, so how would you see that supporting that idea of being willing to be authentic? All, also then as a leader, being able to say, yeah, it is scary. And um, I'm, I'm learning this along with you. So how do leaders, how do leaders do that? How do you be authentic and not scare your team by saying, yeah. you don't know everything? I think to, I mean, you don't want to intentionally scare people, but the fact is we're all scared. We're all nervous. We all are doing something that we've never done before. And um, I think as leaders, it's important to acknowledge that. And it's important to acknowledge it for yourself and talk about it how you're experiencing it. Um, but then equally say, and this is what I'm doing to counter it. These are the actions that I'm taking based on my best guess and information that I'm getting and learning to make sure that we're doing the right things. Um, and it's, it's okay to share fear. It's not okay to share fear and, and, and not say, and this is what I'm doing about it. Mm. Mm -hmm. If you're just talking about what you're scared about and you leave them hanging, you've just, you've just sparked a lot of emotions for people and they have no confidence in their leader or what's around them to help them navigate. Um, so I know for me, it, where I've gotten the best feedback is when I've been authentic in saying, you know, I'm trying this, I'm hoping it's going to work to help me. It's helping me right now, and I'll let you know how it goes. Um, and this is what I'm doing as a leader for you. This is what the organization's doing to counter what we're doing. And um, I'm open to hearing mm -hmm. ideas and suggestions. If you've got ideas about how we can navigate this, by all means, let me know, and then we'll figure it out together. So I think sometimes leaders try to overprotect and assume that people can't handle it um, or they just share too much and think that that somehow makes them more human and helps people come alongside them. It's a balance between the two. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I don't mean to sound this in a condescending way, but you, you want your children on a journey with you when you're going through something. You don't share everything with them. You share the pertinent things with them and you tell them what you're doing about it. And in many ways, you know, staff and team members are looking for the same thing. They don't want to hear it all. It just freaks them out. Um, but they do want to know there's a plan and that you're scared too. Mm -hmm. And that's challenging. And, you know, in what we have been hearing from leader after leader is that the five-year plan is gone. The, th the three-month plan is where we're at these days because we don't know beyond that. So I think 
there are leaders potentially, including myself, who are hearing this season of the podcast. And it almost sounds like everybody's got it all together. Like they've navigated the storm. It seems really good. But I will say I have messed up in this last season because it's again, I'm it's uncharted. So I know I've been very grateful for you to come alongside me when I've been messing up and say, okay, let's fix this. So if there is a leader listening who's who's saying, okay, I've messed up, I've overshared or I've undershared, or I I haven't admitted that I don't know what I'm doing. What would you say to that leader? Mm-hmm. Um, forgive yourself first. L- legitimately forgive yourself. You are human. You make mistakes. Um, you're expected to make mistakes because God made us as people to make choices. We have freedom to choose it means we're going to make bad choices sometimes. And um, I think grace extends to yourself and then ask for it to be extended to you as well through uh, your colleagues or others that you're, you are seeking forgiveness from or um, grace from. I think also as team members, um, we may have heightened stress and anxiety. We also need to be generous with each other. Mm -hmm because we're just, we're just not, we're in times that we don't understand and uh, we're feeling a lot of things out. So I would say grace, extend grace, apologize authentically. And um, I would say, you know, one of the things that I find frustrating about apologies is, you know, people need to try to say, I'm going to try hard to not do it again, but it may happen again. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I intend it. It's just because I know I tend to trip up on these things and it may happen again. I'll Mm -hmm. try, but Mm -hmm. know that the motivation behind what I've done and what I'm doing is genuinely trying to be helpful. And um, I just maybe did it the wrong way. And when you're in front of a team of people and you've shared too much information or the organization is taking a fundamentally new direction, I think humanizing yourself and the leaders around you is really important because Mm. I think a lot of times we think we forget that our leaders are human. They go home, Mm -hmm. they have children, they make meals, they have pets that are throwing up on the floor. (laughs) They have, you know, and so they do things in the moment that are the same as anything you would do in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I think um, empathy is absolutely essential in this time more than ever before. Empathy is critical. Are you a nonprofit leader passionate about your organization's mission, but unsure how to communicate it effectively? Do you wish your communications budget went further, that your development and communications teams worked better together, or that you had a stronger plan to find new supporters? At Graf Martin Integrated Marketing Solutions for Good, we get it. With you in mind, we've custom built solutions for nonprofit organizations to make your message have more impact, reach further and connect with the right people for years to come. Schedule your free consultation by emailing solutions at grafmartin.com. Again, that's solutions at grafmartin.com. Speaking about empathy and well, and, and even just communicating, I think one of the things that we've seen is that some of the organizations that we get to work with, they're they're navigating extreme change in extreme times, but at the same time, there are some things that are helping them stay afloat. (laughs) So, I mean, we can empath we can absolutely empathize with our clients as they're navigating this right now. But at the same time, I think what are some of the things that people are doing right um, as they navigate this? I'll give an example. One of our clients that we get to work with is back to the Bible. And it is extraordinary to me how the timing of helping them really articulate their brand and make a plan right before a COVID crisis hit has so well equipped their team to navigate this season. And so is there anything that you're seeing also in organizations that they're like, they're doing this so well um, to navigate these unprecedented times. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're unique to these times, but I think organizations, I think prior to this situation, you know, in the not-for-profit sector, there's this increasing challenge of fewer donors, 
and of those donors, you're getting more money from the same donors, but the pie is getting smaller and the need to expand that pie, the people that are open to giving of their time, talent and treasure to not for profits was already a problem. So I think organizations were trying to focus on what do we offer a value to them? What is our value proposition and the brand work that that back to the Bible did was very much about, okay, what is our core value proposition as an organization to those that we serve and are seeking support from? So really focusing in and getting rid of the stuff and making choices about stuff that's not core to who you are, um, that kind of grew over time because it's, it was a natural evolution. But when you kind of look at what is the most important thing for you to focus on, you're, you're able to make choices about what not to do anymore. And I see organizations doing that. The difficulty is that there's often staff associated with that. And so staff exits are part of that. Um, but being very clear on who you are and what you do and what you don't do. The other thing I see, and you know, we saw it uh, last week, um, is organizations learning to collaborate with one another mm -hmm. and learning to figure out, because they figured out what's their value proposition, they're then able to say, well, you know, and you know, as a meeting houser, we hear this, you know, it, we may not be the place for you. It may mm -hmm. be somewhere else that you need to go because what you're asking of us, that's actually not what we're good at. We're actually good at this, but guess what? So-and-so is really good at that. And how about you go to them? Mm -hmm. And I think the more organizations can be authentic and honest about who they are and what they do and what they don't do, instead of trying to be everything to everybody, I actually think there'll be more people that are likely to give because Canadians love partnership and cooperation. We see this, like I saw this in brand surveys at World Vision, Canada stands apart as a country where people like people to work together. They don't like it when people are competing. They like it when they see people cooperating. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that message of cooperation and collaboration um, is one that will actually encourage people who don't give and don't engage to do so. Mm -hmm. um, because when you're authentically saying, I'm not great at that, so-and-so is really good at that, go talk to them. Um, and I see a little bit of that happening, um, which is very um, encouraging. And I hope we see more of that as we go mm -hmm. through these times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a dream of mine too, to see even, even the organizations that we get to serve working with each other because they do have such... Um, they have such complementary strengths. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that, yeah. And I know that, you know, here we've been even working on our mission and vision and values and making sure that they're right. And we've landed on this phrase that was shared to me by my friend Heather Card around common grace. And so, you know, are we just to do the Christian work? Or what are we for? And I know as an agency, we've talked very much, and I know this resonated with you and with me as well. We're here to do that common grace. So like, what are the good, th I, my translation of it is, what are the good things that God is doing in the world? And how can we support the people that are doing them? And so that might look like food banks. It might look like justice. It might look like Bible teaching. It might look like um, support for children. Is there any other trend that you're like, and I think co collaboration is critical for working out that common grace. Is there any other trend that you're seeing that you're like, oh, I just, I hope that this keeps growing. I know you also, you also support Waybase um, and are good friends with them. Is there anything you're seeing even through the work with Waybase where you're like, let's keep this going guys? Well, it's interesting. The work with Waybase has been, um, I, what I've been helping them at least currently on is, is clarifying their value proposition. Um, and, um, in that, thinking about how they are accessible to a full range of Canadians, uh, people with varying abilities, uh, people with, you know, economic challenges. Um, so it's been good to see them reflecting on how do we make sure, because the tools that they're creating are visual, like they're a hub on uh, a website and a, an app, which for sighted people, is very accessible, but if you're colorblind or if you have sight difficulties, you know, they're thinking about how are we shutting out uh, mm -hmm. a population? How do we, if the goal of, of Waybase is to help bring about change and make neighborhoods 
um, safe and just for everybody and ensure that the church is part of that journey, how do we make sure we're accessible to everybody? So, you know, the movement we're in right now or have been in for some time around um, Black Lives Matter and Indigenous lives, as part of that, um, what, how, what steps organizations are taking to ensure that they themselves are representative of those that they serve, um, that they ensure that those that they serve are part of the decision making around what they do, um, and those that they serve have, can access and feel part of an authentically equal part of the community that uh, the organization is serving, I think is on the minds of many organizations. Mm -hmm. Some are at different stages in that, um, but that's something I see happening at this same time as well and hope and am encouraged to see some of the thinking that's going mm -hmm. on, you know, talking to one of our clients even recently around how they're going to be making some intentional decisions to hire uh, people that would be traditionally seen as, you know, um, a discriminated group. How do they do that in a way that honors human resources, policies, and laws, uh, but wanting to take the time to figure that out mm -hmm. is very positive. It's so encouraging. We are in a, this has been a very hard year, but I also see it as a very encouraging year. Oh, yes. Because things have been shaken up in ways that they needed to be shaken. And I don't know that we would have had the courage to make the changes. Yes. Yes. Had this not happened. Do you see that? It's hard, it's hard for small and large nonprofit organizations to change. Is that true? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, change is, is, is difficult for individuals. So you can imagine what it is for a large system that's a large organization. I think that what this time has done for us is reveal things m many of us already knew. Mm -hmm. um, that had been worked on by people on the margins of society, but now more people seem to be aware and it's not going away. And our, our freedom is wrapped up in the freedom of others in a way that has become more apparent. Mm -hmm. If we're going to be safe from pandemics, everybody has to be safe. Mm -hmm. So our freedom to live is tied up with other people's freedom in a way that for those of us that are in privileged position is that we've never been mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. And so solving the problem does require equality in solving the problem. So uh, the pandemic is a horrible thing. Um, there's no getting around that. The worst part of it is if we don't learn and we don't mm -hmm. make the changes that we need to make so that the impact of it is you know, felt equally and hopefully equally mm -hmm. people are protected. The horror of it is, do we not change? And if we mm -hmm. don't, that, that is really mm -hmm. make it, makes it more horrible than it is right now. Mm -hmm. Well, and what came to my mind, as you said, that was the question, who is my neighbor? Mm. And I mean, this really comes down to the very basics of our faith, which is to love our neighbor, to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbor as ourself. And so I think that this situation has caused us to say, or hopefully has caused us to say, who is my neighbor? And I mean, that could be the value proposition piece that organizations are missing is just being able to say, who is who is the neighbor that I have been called to serve? And how do I uniquely use my gifts and talents and all of those things to serve them? So for sure. And we get to work on that together, which is incredible. We get to support organizations doing that. Yes. So, Cheryl, is there anything else that you have learned, especially about yourself as a leader and during this time? I know this idea of equality and who is my neighbor. I know you were thinking about that long before as well. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, I think, and you know, folks that know me know that trees are very important to me. Um, so what's been incredibly important, uh, even more so in this season is getting outside and, uh, having the opportunity to go on long walks in trees and, uh, just appreciating what's immediately around me has become more important to me. Um, 
the physical space that I get to live in is amazing. And uh, the, the county that region we live in has a lot of beautiful things to take advantage of. And, um, and I've also decided to take the opportunity to do the Bruce Trail with uh, a few women who uh, also just get a lot out of being out in nature and just being able to observe how these spaces have gone through a lot uh, what that's created, the beauty, the destruction, um, the new life that comes out of it, um, the different stages of our uh, evolution as a society here in Southern Ontario, you know, finding uh, last week, I, we saw different parts of the Welling Canal, which is just a marvel, uh, mm -hmm. you know, getting the opportunity to appreciate that and not realizing that there were like five different versions of it. And mm -hmm we've walked along to see different iterations of this canal that we've created, seeing, you know, bits of barns that have disappeared and, you know, life goes on, things mm -hmm. happen, painful mm -hmm. things happen. Um, but uh, people find ways to move forward. There's pain in it. Uh, but the more that we can come around each other and help each other navigate that pain, the, the it lessens the effect, feeling of the pain and maybe decreases the length of time that it's with us. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's something that I've appreciated mm -hmm. over this season and, and will definitely be continuing. Mm -hmm. It's 900 and kilometers. So that Bruce trail is going to be with me for probably a couple of years. <laughs> well, and I think I mean, what you say brings up something that I have been hearing from different leaders, like that they traveled. You talked about you didn't want to do the 401 commute anymore or that people were traveling all the time. They didn't actually. I think a lot of leaders prior to this had no space to be present where they actually are. And so this gives us a new opportunity for that. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And I would, you know, I'm, I've been thinking about a lot of my colleagues who are like, I wonder what this is doing to them right now, not having the travel anymore. And a lot of their identity was uh, uh, wrapped up in that. And mm -hmm. I would imagine there's a fair number of identity crises going on right now for folks because their whole work life has changed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how are they, navigating that so but being present and enjoying I you know even working from home I've come to really cherish my little office and my my routine um, and um, to me it's just it's a season of disruption but also restoration and mm -hmm. finding the balance between the two because I think as we emerge uh, we need to be ready um, mm -hmm for what's on the other side. Mm -hmm. It's probably not going to be a stark change. It's going to be progressive. And I think making sure we're taking the time to rest, to care for ourselves. If we're having these moments of identity crises, don't walk away from them, engage with them and find some folks to stand with you as you go through it will be very important as we sort of start to figure out the next. And I'm not calling it the next normal because it's just the next. It's just the next. There's nothing normal about it, right? Uh, Cheryl, I'm so glad that people got to meet you today who have never met you before, or people who may have worked with you got to hear a little bit more about like what's behind, um, what's behind the, the, not the exterior, but like what's behind all of that's going on because you get things done. And if anybody gets to work with you, um, they're going to love working with you because you do get things done. So I'm so grateful for that privilege. And thanks for being part of this today. Oh, I'm so grateful. And I'm so grateful to be on this journey with you. It's a blast. It's an absolute <laughs> blast. So thank you. It's fun. Excellent. And if anyone wants to find out more about you or connect with you online, how can they do that? Well, I'm on LinkedIn, so they can do that or they can email me. I'll just use my work email address, which is Cheryl at grafmartin.com. You can find me there and on Instagram too, as well as Cheryl Hotchkiss. So love to talk to anybody. Excellent. Thanks again, Cheryl. I am so grateful that you are just down the hall from me and we get to have these conversations regularly. We, we need do. To have more though. We do. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thanks. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Changemakers podcast brought to you by Graf Martin Integrated Marketing Solutions for Good. 
Graf Martin is Canada's leading integrated marketing and communications agency for nonprofit organizations seeking to do more good. If you need an agile, full service marketing agency to move your organization forward, we get it. Visit grafmartin.com to learn more and schedule your free consultation so that you can do more good.